Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight to the fourth lecture in our position series, um, which brings together A graduates, graduate program directors, and experts from related disciplines to kind of talk about or debate their positions around a common topic. Um, I, tonight's position is grounded, which looks at how um, place can actually inform the making of space or shape different forms of practice. And um, tonight, each of our panelists will make a brief statement on how this relates to their work, and then we'll break out into a general discussion. So please all prepare some questions to ask them. Um, so to briefly introduce tonight's speakers, um, Emmanuel and Martin on the far end um, direct the design and make MArch at Hook Park, which is the AA's Woodland Campus in Dorset. And they'll speak about the role of the forest and, the, and how it shapes projects and the development of the campus. Um, James and Allison graduated from the AA in 2017 and 2018, respectively, and currently run the AA's visiting school in Cambodia um, through the foundation Project Little Dream. Um, and they believe that architecture is a fundamental agent in, in a developing context, and we'll speak about how this unique context of Cambodia has played a role in defining their individual and collective forms of practice since 2009. Um, Spandana, next along, um, is the founder and creative director of Tipoi, a design studio and brand based between Bangalore and London, which challenges perspectives of what is considered Indian design, taking into account India's colonial history and the role it plays in mass producing crafted products for the West. And her design process is about creating a new narrative that takes its inspiration from existing design objects in everyday life and um, trying to define a kind of new set of histories uh, for a kind of pre and um, post independent India. Um, Hussam graduated from the AA in 2012. He's a founding partner of Studio Bound, working on projects between London and the Gulf. And he's also the director of AA Jetta, a visiting school that was launched in 2015. And tonight he'll speak about the research being gathered through this platform to study and archive Makar. Eduardo and Alfredo um, direct the landscape urbanism, MArch and MSC. Um, and tonight they'll discuss the role design can play in bringing together the many sets of economic policies, political decisions, social cultural structures, and other forces that shape and define territory. And Kate Davies, going back to the blocking, um, <laughs> is the head of media studies at the AA and is an artist and an architect. Um, she's the co-founder of Nomadic Design Studio, Unknown Fields, um, Art Practice Liquid Factory, and Field Robotics Group Raven. Tonight she's gonna discuss her site-specific installations and expedition-based work. Um, and I guess all of them will kind of elaborate more on my very quick rapid fire um, bio. But um, please join me in welcoming them all today. Great, I'll kick off. So I was going to give, um, I guess, start a few thoughts on the topic of grounded related to the design and make program. And then mine will pick up and give a bit more detail about sort of specifics of what the what we do, what the students do. Um, I, mean, I think that word is kind of loaded with meanings. I think there's a sort of interpretation that's a kind of presumption about what we're here to discuss. You know, projects that are kind of grounded in reality, in the kind of physical world, in actual kind of practice in a real place, in a real context. Um, you know, I think there's sort of variants on what that word means that are kind of interesting. I think for design and make, it's very explicit, like we are, you know, we're fundamentally kind of embedded in a physical realm, you know, the forest, the place, Hook Park. I think most of you here probably know the program, you know, it's a massive program, you know, it's titled Design and Make. Um, you know, it is, you know, we build architectural constructs, you know, we're very much about the making being the, the basis for our thinking, so immediately, you know, things are grounded in sort of physical reality in that world. You know, the act of making by necessity requires you to work with constraints, you know, of material and of tool. You know, there's a, there's a grounding of the work through that, you know, rather than um, a kind of realm of fantasy in words and in representation, that things are, you know, kind of located in the physical world that we, you know, that we embody, that we work with. You know, working with our bodies adds another layer to that, you know, that there's, you know, these physical artifacts give meaning to ideas, to words. Uh, there's kind of analogy maybe with the sort of hypothesis of, of physical grounding, you know, that artificial intelligence can't operate purely on kind of formal symbols, you know, to really fully understand the world we operate in. We need to have a grounding 
you know, need to be grounded in some kind of embodied reality. There's kind of themes there, I think, that are you know, related to what our, what our topic is. I think that's kind of the intended meaning of, of the title, you know. Um, I think there's a couple of other meanings to throw out. There's sort of the, the teenager being grounded, which I think is a, you know, is a negative version in a way, or the plane being grounded, perhaps more negatively, but like probably the grounded teenager is probably, a, you know, maybe a symbol of something being interesting and creative going on in that teenager. Perhaps the constraint of being grounded actually operates as a way to really force you know, the constraints that really force a kind of creativity and in a weird way perhaps design and make students being you know locked into a, a weird patch of dorset operates in that in that kind of way you know not having the freedom of of london um so it's maybe that kind of axis um and i think there's a very little one about the ground itself um the geology of that i'm sure the lu guys will talk about that a bit more but there's you know our material grows out of the ground you know we're embedded in in a woodland which is in a way a live extension of the of the earth um we are you know our location in dorset is next to the jurassic coast it's kind of part of that geology like it is like it's the unesco world heritage site for its geology and the fact that there's a such an extreme reading of the ground on the on the cliffscape it's kind of exposed you know the, the tilt of the ground just shows these strata of the history of the ground really explicitly you know and hook like the, the topography inland is a reflection of that and hook sits on one of those strips you know so the strip which comes is tilted one way so you have the strip that's exposed in portland portland stone is the era before the strip that hook park sits in you know london is largely built out of portland stone you know the sediments that sat there you know the next layer which is more you know, it's not so rocky. It's kind of a clay is what Hook Park's made of. But it's the same kind of stuff. It is like historic seabed from 150 million years ago. That, those nutrients, those dead sea organisms are the same nutrients that are now, you know, the living material of the tree. You know, the, the image, yeah, sorry, there we go. Like the tree root, this is the um, 3D scan of a, of a tree root that a student extracted recently. Like that, that is extracting that material and turning it into our construction material. You have something kind of really, really literally grounded about what we're doing. Um, and maybe the next image, sort of the, you know, then the resource that we're working with. Sorry, sorry would you mind going back two slides? Um, so as, as Martin said, um, we uh, work from Hook Park. That's our kind of testing ground to engage with large scale, one-to-one -one fabrication. Um, it's our forest, but it's also uh, our studio, our workshop, our material library, um, and our material resource. Um, and we use all different kinds of technologies to investigate that place. So as Martin mentioned, this is a, a LIDAR scan. It takes um, pretty much a fingerprint of, of this root plate of an ash tree. So um, we try to forensically investigate and interrogate the place that we inhabit and reveal aspects which aren't um, immediately obvious. Next slide. So th this is uh, the raw state of our material that you guys normally encounter in, in the DIY stop and see timber as a commodity. We try and engage it on all, all different levels. So first of all, it's a living entity and, and then it kind of gets harvest. And uh, next slide, please. And we apply, we apply all kinds of, no worries. We apply all kinds of ad advanced and traditional technologies to manipulate the timber into our in, um, advanced fabrication techniques. So it's, this, for instance, is the, the steam bending of a, of a tree in, in, in its entirety. So we kind of hijack existing and traditional tools um, to manipulate our source material. Um, we look at more advanced technologies as well, and, and, and we got Charlie, who's our secret weapon that helps us build the bespoke end effector. So this is a, a band so we took apart and, and mounted on a robot so we can have a higher level of precision when we execute and when, next slide please, we produce these rather complex uh, and bespoke components. So, so this is, um, we develop 
particular workflow. So this, for instance, is, is a glue lamb beam, um, which is uh, the stock material is appropriated, approximated, and then um, offered to the robot, and the robot then machines out all, all precision and details. Next slide, please. And in that way, we're looking to compose these elements and build um, uh, complex and experimental new architectural constructs. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, so I'm Alison, and this is James, and we are the heads of AAVS Cambodia, but also we run um, an NGO based in Cambodia. So. In a nutshell, I think what grounds us is the place that we work in. Um, for the past 10 years, we've been based in the same province called Takao. It's in the southern region of Cambodia. And we design, run, and build uh, village schools. This is our fifth project that you're seeing. And um, it's the first project that we actually acquired this site. Um, we are we usually work within the village context, but for this site, it is in a confluence of five villages. And what really defines uh, our practice there is that we don't see that there is a role of an architect per se, as in there's no prescribed role. So our sort of um, architecture mission is to see how we then position ourselves in such a context. Um, and in, in doing our work, we heavily rely on uh, the people we work with and we use architecture as a, the intersection to sort of bind them together, whether it may be our tuk-tuk driver, the translator, a carpenter, or a local villager. We all communicate via building and making. So um, the projects we've done so far span from sanitation facilities that we build for our schools, to places of play or spaces of learning. Um, and in these projects, it's a real collective effort. When we first started building, because we're an NGO, we, every Christmas we would invite um, mainly uh, students from Hong Kong and they would come and build it with us. So the Gabian wall that you see on the left uh, was collected from broken tiles found within the, the temple site, which is where we work. And it was sort of stacked according to the, the stratas in which we found. So we found three types of tiles from three different kind of periods in which the temple besides us was demolished. Um, and in the fourth, uh, in the middle photo, uh, perhaps the sort of layering exists in time. When the school ver was first built, it was sort of big and barren, but as sort of time went on, um, life also kind of engulfed the school, whether it may be children or whether it may be the flora and fauna. And um, this year we embarked on a kind of a new challenge and we started our first visiting school in which we invited like-minded individuals to join us to search for an, a position, a position of how we should practice, in Cambodia as architects, a client, a maker, and a contractor. And in this uh, photograph, we were having one of our first sort of sharing sessions. We rented a house for 14 days, and in the house we worked together, we had meals, we talked about, um, of course, architecture, but we also looked deeply into the Khmer culture and through food we found a common ground for us to discuss the possibilities of what we can do. So some of the outcomes of the 14 day visiting schools were a series of work. The first one on the left is a birdhouse made by a student who wanted to mimic um, the kind of classroom that we've built previously. And in the middle was a sort of experimental kitchen that uh, was both a barbecue pit and sort of a, a refuge for a tree. And in the last one, it's, it's a door to nowhere. Um, what's sort of uh, missing in these photos is perhaps the amount of effort it took for us to make these happen in 14 days, the sort of journey that a student had from not knowing any power tools or, or being a first year in architecture to 
being able to make something of their own. Um, and I think this sort of revision and repetitive process is what we try to aspire in our work and also what motivates us to continue serving. Um, so I guess Keep Boy is based at Green Bank on London and does Indian design. What is Indian design? This is a question I set out to explore without really knowing where it would lead me and the route I took was kind of quite open. So my idea of Indian has started at a question that was directed to myself. Um, after living in London for about 15 years, but also ideas of Indianness that surrounded me as food, culture, objects, spaces. Um, the narrative I saw emerging was a bit bleak. It was a feeling, if I could describe it, um, a kind of comfort and warmth of going to the same place over and over again because you knew what was on the menu. And if the menu changed, like, you were not going to be happy. Um, this is a grade three uh, building in South Wales, so it's kind of like an idea of an Indo-Chinese kind of, um, yeah, but it's like a Bollywood cinema at the same time, but now it's like an open kind of um, market. Sorry, I'm not talking to mic. Um, so, the next is the blue people. Okay. I guess what I'm trying to say is that at the outset, I realized there was a good amount of unpicking to do uh, when I was making design here based in London. Uh, I think if we're talking about this idea of being grounded, um, Every time I talked about India, I was always asked about the presence of craft in my work, uh, which I felt was reconfirming a Western idea of Indianness or Indian design, uh, where it could start and possibly where it could end. But also this kind of visual presence of craft meant a certain type of visual language, a certain type of visual storytelling. So this, for example, the video that you just saw was, um, did it do it? was a simple storage jar that I made in copper, like was made by us in copper. Um, and it's kind of used me, uh, by using an industrial spinning mach machine, pretty much the same way it would be made anywhere else in the world. Um, and this um, is another picture of like an industrial factory in Uttar Pradesh. Um, I guess it's like, you know, factory set up for mass manufacture. Um, and it's again an image that you don't see as much as say images of block printing or indigo dyeing or kind of like textile weavers. But possibly this, this kind of factory is making, I don't know, half of the world's tea light holders at this moment. Um, so I guess for me, it's quite revealing of what kind of image means India and what kind of image means Indian design. Um, so I just want to talk about a textile project that we did, which is called Modern Kanta. And this is a collaboration we did with a design studio based in Copenhagen, where we took a very typical embroidery technique, uh, Kanta, which is basically a running stitch kind of going up and down, and it kind of quilts um, pieces of textiles together. And we resolved a new design inspired by the kind of essence of this Kanta stitch. But I guess what we did is we kind of used an industrial quilting machine, which was actually suggested to us by the craftsmen or the karigar who worked in the embroidery factory. Um, so it's kind of, we, we kind of replaced the, you know, the presence of the hand by this kind of, you know, these stitches that were kind of made by a machine. Um, and then another project, which is our most recent one, we kind of work with concrete. Uh, so the images here are kind of Nekchand Garden in Chandigarh. Um, so Nekchand was a kind of road construction supervisor who kind of worked under the Corbusier re regime in Chandigarh. And he, while he was working there, he was kind of secretly building this garden using broken glass tiles 
and just a bunch of unusable things from the construction. So I guess like it's hardly surprising that everyone in Chandigarh ended up hanging out in, the, in this place instead. Um, this place kind of had 5,000 visitors a day and kind of still does. So for me, I just want to highlight her co context. So this idea of being grounded is so important anywhere. So concrete, for example, is really not seen or treated as a sacrosanct modernist material in India. Because first, the first use of concrete that India saw was PWD architecture by the British, which was essentially kind of modern scaffolding. And from then on, since the boom in the 90s, concrete became the material of choice for everyone, like you could go to buy a bag of concrete, like you would go and buy vegetables. Um, and then it's like, it go, it's everything from like adverts for concrete is kind of directed directly to the public. So it's never, it's not kind of like, you know, um, it's, it's like you as a consumer consuming concrete. So we are very, very interested in this kind of use of concrete and how the functionality of the structure wasn't kind of good enough where concrete is always seen as an opportunity for something else to happen, an opportunity to kind of express and decorate. So this image of um, the god made out of plaster and a concrete water tower next to it kind of summed up a lot um, of what was happening on the ground. Um, I guess how material is absorbed into the landscape in a way that is very kind of unique to place. And that's another water tower. Um, so this is a flyover structure that, for example, has been totally painted over. Again, it's kind of like reinforced concrete. Um, and then the surface is just appropriated for something that's seen as more useful. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, this poses a big, big question about, you know, why did Chandigarh fail? Um, and then I guess the way we kind of uh, took that story and made something off of it via the studio um, is that we kind of created this range of products which looked at kind of um, the secondary uses of these structures. So kind of playing with this idea of design and decoration, use and unofficial use. So the functional aspects of the architecture were rendered into decorative aspects, but also the fact that, you know, we kind of created this collection of planters and vases that are purely decorative, uh, but using concrete with kind of industrial material. Um, and then kind of also inviting you to kind of play and participate. So that's like a, a vase. And that's a planter. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just tell you my story? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hassan. Um, Today I'll be speaking to you in the capacity of the work that I'm doing um, with AA Jeddah. Um, AA Jeddah, um, which was launched in 2015, is uh, in partnership with the work, in alignment with the work that we're doing with our own studio based between London and the Gulf. Um, is a very personal project to me uh, and my partners. It's, we're looking to archive and study Mecca, which is um, in Saudi Arabia, um, the holiest city um, regarded to all Muslims. And um, we're studying Mecca for us at a time which is actually very critical, um, both, uh, um, both um, uh, economically, politically, and in terms of the development that's occurring within the city. Mecca is changing at such a rapid pace, um, uh, um, which is um, quite uh, staggering and actually quite challenging. So, no, so the, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> for the purposes of our research. And, um, with reference to this notion of um, of what uh, of uh, being grounded, or what does that actually mean, in the context of the work we're doing in Mecca, for us to be grounded in many ways is to be humbled, and it's to be, and I, I say that because uh, Mecca is considered sacred ground; it is holy land, in many, um, as as we regard it. So um, that's one aspect um, of uh, of the work that we're doing. It definitely has that parameter attributed to it, and the influence of place for us is inherent and inevitable um, through the work and through the research that we're actually doing. And in the context of the work and research that we're doing in Mecca, our work is very much um, reactive to the context in which it's uh, working with. It is a place where the uh, shifting landscapes of its physical formation and economies um, are driving um, a lot of the work that we're doing 
um, uh, constantly. And, uh, and um, for us, the que the, um, this question again of being grounded and being rooted in place lies in this notion of permanence. Well, and in the context of Mecca, actually also there is rather the lack of permanence in a context that is actually subject to constant change and evolution. And how can, and for, the, for us the question is, how can we shape a project in a place that is constantly changing? And in doing, so, and our position on that is we do not resist this rapid change, but rather we embrace it. Um, one example I will give, for example, um, seen in the image here is an aerial shot that we took in 2015 of an area um, that's uh, merely meters away from the Holy Mosque. It is the largest undeveloped, um, I mean, the authorities call it a slum. I, I will, um, there are opinions on whether it is a slum or not. Um, but basically this image was taken in 2015 and when we went to inside into these um, uh, neighborhoods to study them and to record them, we actually uh, went back uh, four months later to find that 60% um, of everything was already demolished. So, and this is an area that we heavily started, I would say documenting as in taking photographs, taking measurements, talking to the people. And then when we went back, again, we couldn't in a way complete a lot of the work that we set out to do. And this is largely because of um, the pace of development that's happening in Mecca. So uh, to also define the impact of a place can suggest this idea of an absolute place as a fixed and defined subject in order for us to measure or assess from. And again, this is an idea that is challenged by the alter egos of Mecca and a city that actually neither belongs to its citizens or its pilgrims. Um, and in many cases, Mecca is a city lost in translation. And for us, the question at play therefore presents a challenge to address what Mecca stands for as a place in itself. Um, and this is again, an issue that we address uh, through our research. And in the context of our work, while the physical landscapes and places of the city continue to change, our sense of space within Mecca therefore starts to relate to the invisible landscapes of the city, prompting us to expand our scope into the spatial parameters of the city. An integral component for Mecca is its sacred stature and holy association as the most sacred space for all Muslims. And we look at Mecca as um, the city as a mosque, Mecca as a city is sacred ground, much like the mosque. And then uh, it is considered sacred ground as such, the urban domain of its metropolis is one that is spiritually and consequentially tied um, to the mosque and, and the practice of the religion. So by acknowledging this principle, what we do is we graduate into a looser interpretation of defining this idea of what a space is and decipher the development, uh, the development happening in Mecca. And in turn, we can begin to answer the question of how space, in this case, the holiness of a place, can impact the design of a project or shape a new form of practice of work that we're doing. And this is something that hopefully we can elaborate on during the course of conversation. Um, and one thing just I wanted to point out is a project that we started as part of AA Jidda and this notion of city as a mosque and understanding this holiness of the space. How can we document the holy, like a holiness of a space? It's just something not very tangible. And again, we didn't necessarily want to only look at the Holy Mosque because again, one of the reasons we wanted to do a, uh, a lot of our research is to also look at Mecca as a city of a whole. So um, this, is an, this is a snapshot into one exercise that we started doing um, in partnership with the local university in Saudi. And uh, this is basically a catalog of a sample of the mosques in Mecca. And basically what we managed to do over the course of a year and a half is actually map and cat catalog over 350 mosques within Mecca. And what we did was we went into, we 3D modeled the mosques, we took photos of these mosques. And again, these are just like, I suppose, little report cards of, um, again, understanding the sense of space um, and place within Mecca. Well, hello, I'm Alfredo. But I'm beginning to get a quick a bit of what we see, uh, the position of landscape urbanism, the being grounded. Uh, as you can imagine, in landscape urbanism, there's a lot of ground. There's quite a lot of work with the ground, scripting, and actually physical ground with the physical models that we have there of tank. Um, and the issue of grounding is actually quite, quite important for the, for the students to be projective with it, but also being critical with it. One of the things that 
we realize is that sometimes the word grounding ends up being a way of naturalizing uh, decisions, of, of rendering something as being inevitable. Uh, if something is based on something else, or something is inspired of something else, and we just say it is grounded on, in a way it seems that it's better, it's kind of like more solid, more sound, more proper, just yes, because we're using the word ground. And in a way we want the students to have a certain critical distance from that concept of solidity, of properness, of, of, uh, of excessive uh, certainty that ground can actually imply. And we want to see ground as something which is more fluid, that moves, that changes, that is a place of negotiation, that is a place of, of, a, of a certain level of, 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 uh, of change. We like to use and work on problems of simulations, on problems of how to treat the ground and the earth as something that moves. We use quite a lot of either physical and digital simulations of geomorphological processes. And in a way, when we talk about geomorphology, we like a lot this image from John Ruskin, which is the study of a, of a nace rock in uh, Glenfin Lass, Scotland. Uh, the gnase is this type of mix between calcareous and clay materials. And what I like from Ruskin is this romantic obsession with the detail, uh, and at the same time with the process, and at the same time with matter, with quality, which in a way came at the beginning of the birth of geomorphology, or more geomorphology, geology as a science. Before it became a science, there was this amazing mix between those who actually were simply fascinated by the depiction of nature before actually the idea of science and art on this field, in a way, got separated. There was this sort of like collaboration between those who studied geology and those who actually were illustrating the earth and the process in the earth. Uh, that in a way suddenly got split. No? On the one hand, we saw those people that went along these lines of representation and sort of like using the representation uh, and engineering as a way of controlling. These are illustrations shown in the book of uh, Jules Verne, uh, The Adventures of the Russians and Three Englishmen in the South Africa, where two teams of surveyors, they just go there to survey what they see in a way of being able to control it to the point that there's a war between the two countries and they only get together at the end while sort of like engineering science triumphs and in a way shows itself above all difficulties, but always from the perspective of controlling what they see. No? So that's a way in which the sort of like scientific discourse went on the one side. On the other hand, we went, you know, from, from Ruskin, we end up with this sort of like pre raphaelite view of of, of geology and of nature. In this case, is people collecting shells in Peckwell uh, Bay by William Dice. It's a painting that in a way talks about the ending of this marriage between science and, and illustration, the minute in which everything becomes a bit more gloomy, everything becomes a bit more nostalgic and a bit more worrying with the guys actually going to pick up the shells. I think you cannot see it very well here, but there's the Halley Comet that is passing in the, ba in the back that in a way tells about something that's not quite there and not quite controlled there as a way of saying bye-bye to this type of nice intermingling, which is something we want to get back onto and we want the students to look at those forms of representing geology, ground, morphology, as a projective basis and not so much in terms of the optimization, in terms of the sort of like controlling mechanisms linked to these ideas of representation. Uh, thank you. Um, I just uh, also wanted to add on top of this uh, geomorphological and material approach that also within the program of landscape urbanism, uh, we are um, preoccupied on issues uh, that uh, obviously relate to what it means to be grounded, but uh, from a also political, social, and economic perspective. And uh, the next slide will show, or at least will attempt to show uh, examples of how, or what, what I mean by that. No? So the, the first image is uh, a sequence of the edification of the system of lakes in which uh, Mexico City uh, was grounded, or water. Uh, um, and uh, uh, what, it, what happens is that uh, there is a relation, oh, 
it, it, which I think is still ongoing in Mexico City, uh, of, uh, of mentality to, to control nature, to master nature. And, uh, and this mentality is uh, an ongoing kind of uh, condition, which end up in the final season, which is in 2000, and, and it's uh, continuous, uh, in which uh, land is seen as a commodity and water is seen as a threat. Um, and today in Mexico City, even though it's, um, uh, it seems like in the last image, uh, humans has, uh, they have a triumph over, over nature, uh, the city lives in a, in a big paradox. Mm. On the one hand, it, sho it suffers of shortages of water and, uh, and droughts. And on the other hand, uh, every summer it gets flooded, no? as if the lakes were reinstated every, every year. And, um, and it's something that, uh, to me, also reflects a, an interesting uh, condition that is not, not what is happening in the city. Like uh, the last weeks, Mexico City has been embroiled into a big polemic about uh, airports. Uh, uh, one of them is an airport that is being built by New Foster, uh, Norman Foster in one of the last uh, space, if you see the last image, uh, of land remnants of that lake, um, and that airport will cover the majority of the lake bed. No? And on the other hand, uh, to maintain the actual airport uh, and just supported by existing other ones. No? And I think uh, this is a a discussion that the city is having that is missing, you know, a larger vision or a larger kind of perspective of the city because uh, the two airports are, again, uh, enclosed or framed within a perspective or an, a mindset that is about controlling nature, that it's about in short term uh, producing progress and uh, fueling um, economic growth by uh, the enhancement of a fossil fuel economy. And, uh, and I think for us, uh, at least in landscape urbanism, the question is uh, not about the, let's say the architectural objects, no? in this case airports, but the larger vision that has actually get us into the condition that the city is right now. Could you go to the next one? Uh, the second image is uh, a, an image that uh, Andreas Mal, uh, a geographer from Sweden, uh, included in his book called The Progress of This Storm. Uh, and he uses this image basically to ground a theory of the warming planet in which we live. No? Um, what he means is that, uh, or what you see in the image is uh, a painting that was done in the second quarter of the 19th century where, uh, or when the uh, British Empire uh, basically uh, expand uh, their dominion uh, around the world. No? And in the image you see uh, two people, one representative, let's say, of the Royal Navy and another one which might be, which is the one in the center that might be the merchant or a, an entrepreneur. And the, they discover a seam of coal in the middle of an island called Laborno in Borneo. And what Andreas Mal suggests uh, by using this or by saying that he's grounding his uh, theory about the climate change today is that images like this where um, uh, in this case the British uh, Empire discover a fuel that was uh, basically fueling the steamboats in which their expansion and the colonization is, uh, can only be explained or explain the conditions in which we live today because this image is, uh, has been repeated endless times in the last 200 years uh, by literally uh, getting out of the ground uh, uh, the fossil fuel uh, that is fueling li literally our world today no? and that we are basically living by. Uh, and so one of the questions is whether, uh, or at least I think in, in the program is uh, whether we should be um, challenging, let's say, the, our uh, profession as a service provider of a fossil fuel economy that is actually kind of uh, leading the way we are uh, with the planet and in the conditions in which they are. Uh, could you go to the next one? And the last one is uh, as the two plates of uh, uh, the alluvial valley of the lower Mississippi River. I mean, this is only two uh, out of um, quite a few, no? uh, 30 something plates that describe uh, um, how the Mississippi River moves over the Malinia. No? And this was, this was uh, plates that were drawn by uh, Harold Fisk, who was a cartographer from the Army Corps. And, uh, <coughs> and what is interesting about these images is uh, that I 
uh, what I think is interesting is the encounter of two positions, or uh, which becomes like a palimpsest in tier one. On the, on the one hand, which is the most obvious, is uh, the dynamics of a river, no? of a landscape that is in constant move, that is constantly changing. Um, uh, and that you see in the image in uh, the different colors that depicts uh, the position of the river and its evolution over centuries. But on the other hand, which is less visible, is the grid that kind of crisscross the whole map. Uh, because the map was done uh, not only to understand how nature works, but to control it. No? It's similar to the previous images that I've shown, no? uh, this idea to master uh, nature. Uh, and, uh, uh, and as some of you know, well, uh, the river Mississippi has been uh, enclosed and controlled in a set of uh, levees, dams, and locks no? that basically try to improve navigation purposes, uh, irrigation quality, and also to control flooding, which is, again, similar to the case of Mexico City, seen as a, as a threat. No? So all these issues uh, that somehow combines geophysical conditions but also geopolitical conditions are elements that we are trying to, uh, on the one hand, or unveil or reveal through the landscape urbanism processes. But at the same time, we ask the question of whether the profession should be looking at uh, larger visions or larger perspectives that give us um, geographical and historical groundings for the way we uh, practice uh, what we call architecture, or, or in our case, what we call landscape urbanism. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about unknown fields, which I run with Liam Young. Um, unknown fields is a nomadic research studio, an art practice. Um, we assemble groups of architecture students alongside collaborators from the fields of art, science, and technology, and venture out on expeditions to bear witness to infrastructural landscapes, uh, industrial ecologies, and precarious wilderness. And from this, we make objects and films uh, from this expedition work, exploring the dispersed narratives that coalesce to form a contemporary city. So I'd like to just set out here some of the contexts and agendas of unknown fields. Uh, most importantly, to discuss how the work is underpinned by a particular approach to context as a rejection of the site as a bounded uh, piece of ground for the architectural object, if you like. Um, and also to question how the roles of architects in relation to their sites of operation might be reassessed in an ever complex, more connected, more mappable world. Um, experimenting with modes of practice, perhaps, that are not restricted to the idea that the solution must be a building or that the solution might even be physical. Um, so the project of Unknown Fields is in its 10th uh, year. Um, we've done about 14, I think, expeditions. Um, journeys to distant places that attempt to reveal something about the familiar reflected in the unfamiliar. They've taken us out into the blinding white, lithium-soaked landscapes of the Bolivian Altiplano, across the South China Sea aboard a container ship, through the Texaco oil fields of Ecuador and the hallowed beaches of the Galapagos Islands. They've taken us to conspiracy-riddled testing grounds of Area 51 um, and other US military outposts to Madagascar's Wild West Sapphire Pits and the frozen Arctic sea ice of far north Alaska. And they've taken us to the irradiated wilderness of Chernobyl and the vast gold mines of the Australian outback. So some of these, like Chernobyl, I guess, have been landscapes as villain. Um, others, like Galapagos, the Arctic, or the Amazon, poster boys of purity and wilderness. Um, but many in between are the unsung spaces of production. So our focus broadly is on exploring a complex present, 
um, through existing and emerging narratives that play out between urban centers in these kinds of remote landscapes. And typically we trace stories and objects, tangible and intangible cult cultural artifacts to the sources and sites and the locations that create and incubate them. So for instance, the shiny pixel cloud rhetoric of Im immaterial technology of our iPhones and iPads belies an atlas of very physical Chinese landscapes from which much of it springs forth. And in the Australian outback, a financial fiction like the gold price is powerful enough to sculpt geological scale landforms. Whilst in Alaska, the statistics of climate change are calculated in a laboratory landscape at the top of the world. An icy expanse we are warming simply by Googling the same statistics. So I guess the physical landscapes that we visit then are an index of bigger systems and in themselves points of departure for us proverbial iceberg tips of, deep, of a deep and complex array of sites which slip from material to immaterial, from mega mine to mineral model, from cargo ship to container stacking algorithm, from mountain to GPS coordinate. So this is a field that necessitates maybe a different kind of field work and it offers up rather strange kinds of sites within which to operate. And we're searching for ways to address complexity in the collision of the physical sites with the wide array of abstract and immaterial sites that accompany them. So in the story of things, supply chains and networks are the journey narratives of matter and energy. And with this as a spatial structure, we deploy film to narrate the network of hidden stories that has solidified to form these sites. So we use speculative scenarios as critical instruments, um, and we use these for exploring emerging conditions, and as such deal in reality, um, but the operational storytelling that we're looking to deploy through the films that we make and the objects is built with a forceful kind of parafiction. Um, so para parafiction, like a paramedic, as opposed to a medical doctor, um, is, a, is related but not quite a member of the character, uh, category of fiction, remaining a bit outside of it, um, not performing its procedures in the hygienic cl uh, clinics of literature, but has one foot in the field of the real. Um, and just to conclude, so the stories that we construct are about faraway places, often, but in fact occupy a kind of territory in between here and there that are cited within the space of our collective cultural narratives, such as logistical logics and data absurdities, value systems and economic constructs, manufactured desires and imagined fears stories, myth, and the machinations of global media. That's it, thanks. Well, thank you all um, for a very diverse and also quite fascinating set of presentations. Um, I'm aware that two of our panelists need to take a train back to Hook Park, so I won't ask that many questions, and I'll open it up to the audience sooner rather than later. But um, to kick things off, I wanted to pick up on something that Kate was talking about, about um, physical landscapes being a kind of index of a lot, much larger system. And I think each of you have touched on kind of invisible forces of uh, um, things that shape landscapes or territories. Um, sometimes things that are already there, but maybe we don't see, like the roots that um, the design and make presented, uh, other people involved in a site that maybe not, uh, or 
are kind of together helping the architect shape the architecture of that place. Um, Spandana, when you were talking about kind of changing the associations with offer material, like how do you start to change people's value systems? Hussam, where you were talking about the kind of the continual pace of change and how do you start to intervene in that context? Or I guess the last two presentations when you were talking about these different ways to reveal these shifts, flows, um, and forces. So I was just curious as, as whether we could start the discussion by talking about what are the tools we can use to reveal these and how do we use them in a way to track change when it's happening so quickly. Um, I know you talked about using film as one method, but you also have used objects in the past. And I was just quite curious to see if there was different strategies for doing this, but also um, whether there's some common ground in how you all operate. Since you are sitting next to me, um, uh, to maybe answer a question, um, I'm not sure it was a long question, <laughs> but um, I guess for us, maybe the most important site of the things that we do is the site of our collective, the stories that we tell ourselves or our collective cultural narrative, our collective um, the force of um, contemporary culture. So to maybe explain um, seemingly frivolous things like um, trends sparked on social media that create um, demand for a certain product, um, say for Christmas, um, can generate huge changes in landscapes and um, obviously kind of um, conflict in mining areas. And it's this idea that actually these tiny, many, many, many tiny acts move mountains. Um, and so that site where those acts are kind of incubated, the site of our own kind of whims and desires, is as much a geological force as the mining company, but more so is where it begins. So I suppose we're interested in trying to get under the, the hood of that site and then operate through films and narrative objects that also come back to cite themselves in that site. Maybe, maybe if I continue with the Supreme Fab work. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, for us, uh, we use a lot of, um, let's say, cartographies and dynamic uh, simulations to try to describe um, even perhaps some of the landscape that Kate was uh, describing. No? Like, in many of our cases, is uh, I think, to reveal or to be aware of how landscapes and territories are created, no? And um, how can we be critical about it? For example, uh, there's a lot about um, talking uh, about sustainable cities, no? And, uh, and for us, it's like, what does it mean to be sustainable um, if those cities are basically produced not by the area within the city which are enclosed, but perhaps, you know, what is the food that all the people in cities are producing, are uh, needed to be, uh, you know, to be in that city, or what are the materials from all the buildings um, from where we are designing those, those uh, supposedly sustainable cities, no? So uh, the cartographies or the simulations that we produce are trying to reveal that set of networks that uh, basically describe how uh, we are attached you know, to, uh, to other parts of the world and, uh, and to be aware how we are as you know, architects or designers by uh, doing uh, or drawing specific lines or proposing specific things in sites might be or not affecting other territories. You know? And that's how I think or one of the purpose of using uh, cartography or a simulation you know, to to understand a larger perspective no? and, uh, and see how uh, we can intervene within those processes that normally are uh, seen just within the, the architecture as an object, no? rather than as a landscape or as a territory, which is something that we embrace a lot. Yeah. I, think, I think that's quite interesting to just kind of expand a little bit on the idea of simulations. I think with the design and make, our, our physical engagement with the matter and, and the ambition that, and the target that we actually want to physically produce these um, 
they remove a lot of the obsolete in, in a world of kind of digital design where everything is possible. Um, so it kind of sets these constraints quite immediately. Um, I think the realization uh, of the embedded energy within the timber and the material that we use also helps to counterbalance that. You know, if you are physically surrounded by trees that are 40 years old, and you have to physically identify the trees that are going to move, uh, you know, get cut down and will, will be used as a, as a um, as a material to build, um, it removes this disconnect, and I think. Um, we could be quite critical of, of our architectural practice, and there is, a, there is a humongous disconnect between the people that design and, and um, draw up the packages, draw the data for, for production, um, and the people that actually build it. So in many ways, we try to uh, reposition and recalibrate that, and maybe even offer opportunities for um, alternative modes of practice of architecture. I think that's quite a, a good way for us to rethink about our positions. And I think when we talk about technologies or in tools, um, that yeah, some people use chainsaws and, and CNC machines, someone uses films, but I guess what we can bring to the site are us as architects. And uh, someone would think that the project is really the understanding of site. But um, I think some other architects would react as, uh, I think the artifact is what constructs space. The understanding of it can only be an understanding. And so I think um, um, what, um, I guess what links, um, what I think can communicate here with one architect, to, one architect to another is how we talk about or how we define that context. Um, yeah, yes, that we, we look at our work, our immediate context, we almost define by our own, by our own limits. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 amount of, the amount of hacksaws and the amount of hammers that we can gather and muster is what we can do and defined by what we do. And I think it, it's really interesting to see how on the, on the table, how we push that limit. But it's also interesting, I think, to see how we don't push those limits and see how we interact with those landscapes. Um, I think uh, for us, the, I would somewhat understand that um, ground is extremely fluid, a liquid process, but uh, working with ground and earth ourselves, I, would, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing to move. Um, I guess, um, I think you mentioned something in your presentation where you said um, about there not being a specific role set out uh, where I guess you're kind of like defining yourself as you go along, uh, where are you, what is the, are you operating as an architect, are you operating as a, you know, kind of just a contemporary practitioner, kind of open to all these kind of, um, the very broad design briefs. So I feel like when, um, I guess being on the ground, like for me meant there was needed to be a lot of adaptability and then I guess this kind of, you know, where, where are you drawing your boundaries of like who you are and what are you making? So there's, um, there's a, I think you end up taking a lot more or like there are other roles that just kind of end up emerging where the designer, I guess somewhere like India has, you know, there's, there's no role for a designer. Um, so the designer kind of takes on this role where you kind of become a translator between um, you know, manufacturer and someone who produces the design, uh, where you know the the engineer would otherwise do that. So I feel like the yeah adaptability is something that I feel, you know, is something that yeah. Um, I mean, I would also like. I mean, I think adaptability even for us is a very apt term because I mean, just to go back to your question, Manija, quite specifically, what are the tools, for example, that we use? in order to, let's say, um, manage with this, let's say, extremely rapid change, where we literally the change has, is outpacing the pace of our own research and documentation. So one of our approaches is we, we actually had to rethink not only how we're doing our research, but who we're involving in our research. So we actually, um, I would say, part of our mandate, so to speak, is that we actually don't only work with architects. We actually work with uh, 
for our work in Mecca specifically, we work with a lot of historians, we have to work with a lot of anthropologists, um, we've worked with writers, people who all come to collectively engage in this research project in order to capture this idea of a city from multiple perspectives and the, as a reaction to something that we know is no longer going to exist and potentially in, let's say, two or three months. So I think just, yeah, expanding our scope, um, in like that notion of adaptability and enlarging, enlarging this lens of how we're looking at something. And which, which, which is why, for example, I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, why would us actually, in a way, to look at the invisible landscapes of the city, let's say the holiness, how does one document this holiness of a place, which is not so much grounded in a physical presence per se, but more in the spiritual connotations of a space, is one of our tactics to document something, actually, because we know this holiness is not gonna go anywhere. It's gonna, I mean, the holiness of the, the place is there, and it's grounded, although it's not physically there, so, yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, well, I have another question, so I'll keep going. Um, I actually wanted to pick up on something that um, Martin said at the beginning, because I thought that was, I thought I really liked how you expanded the definition of grounded to include the teenager being grounded in their room. Um, but I liked how you, you've interpreted that as a kind of way to, kind of create a culture of creativity. And I think that was what was really interesting in terms of how site or context can provide inspiration for a project or a practice. And um, that's also what we were thinking about when bringing all of you together for this panel. Um, but I was wondering kind of how you each kind of go about that. Like if we started by talking about tools, um, what are the kind of ways in which place can actually be a driver for a project um, or m multiple projects as a form of practice. Like, how did you each start working on the specific sites that you were, or uh, places that you're working in now? Um, I think for us, a lot of it stems from the fact that we work in education mainly, and then architecture probably comes in second. So, the place we ground ourselves is on. Um, the literacy of the children and that's what we want to improve and in terms of space um, because we do provide a free school so it's sort of a space in which they don't have to be here and if they're choosing to come then it should be something that is sort of beyond what they see every day and in that sense that's what inspires us perhaps to then challenge what is the everyday for them and how do we, from foreign lenses, explore those ideas um, in, a, in a respectful and, and uh, but yet curious way? And in terms of sort of making, I think, in building anything, it's an inherently slow process. And you embark on this task, but then most of the time, you're faced with so many limitations and constraints that you have to morph. And within those sort of parameters, we we begin to test our own curiosity, whether it's it's possible. And I think it's through understanding one's limits do you then become more creative. And we've been very lucky to have met a lot of people within the community in our province that have the skills to sort of show us how. But then um, I think the, the project in itself is also perhaps slightly similar to, to charting an unknown landscape. We don't know what exactly the outcome of providing a free school would do in a sense that maybe a child will come back 10 years later and tell us something happened in their lives that inspired them to do something else. But we sort of have to have this faith in what we're doing. So to hope that maybe one, one of these days uh, it'll provide ground for someone else. I mean, for us, the, what prompted us to do our work was an urgency for, um, to do the work because, um, unfortunately, um, Saudi being Saudi, like it's a very restrictive country uh, with extremely restrictive access, and Mecca more so because um, Mecca is a city where you can actually only enter it if you're Muslim. So the urgency to document and record this from, let's say, in an academic way and to 
record the city in like it was purely out of a need because there was a shortage that we saw in that and that really was the trigger for us um, and the way that I mean it's funny because in a way like although we're studying Mecca like Mecca in a way as a city obviously it's our testing ground it, ha it facilitates obviously our work but it also has restricted our work in many ways it's a it's a very double-edged sword in that context so um, I think what I'm trying to say is um, like our work is only um, like this, sorry, I'm trying to um, just to find the word. I think um, um, because of the nature of the city that we're working in, um, I'm sorry, I scratched that, excuse me. Um, I need to re recalibrate my thoughts, sorry. Okay. I lost my thought. Maybe I'll cut in them. Um, I think, um, if, I mean, from our point of view, we, we, it starts, actually starts here. So um, something like this, which is a lithium mine in Bolivia, um, started with um, a, a keynote speech by Elon Musk on the uh, future of Tesla and the house battery, um, sparking uh, a huge debate over the future of where uh, all the lithium for all the electric batteries were going to come from. Um, or a project we've recently done uh, in India looking at the textiles industry came from um, a statement. We read that the textile industry is the second most polluting industry to oil, um, which came as a surprising statistic to us. Um, so it's, it's then becomes a kind of reverse journey, um, a journey kind of unmaking something. Um, so in that case, we, we start at the end and we end up at the beginning of something. Um, and so it's always a kind of set of relational steps that will take us on a trajectory. Um, we're not going to one place, we're going on a, a, a kind of stream of events that take you back mostly to a raw material. Um, and then, so for instance, for we did a project called Rare Earthenware, which um, was a, a film in reverse from essentially a mobile phone, a laptop, and an electric car battery um, back through the spaces of manufa shipping, manufacturing, um, mineral processing, back to the hole in the ground. Um, and from there, we took a, a load of radioactive and toxic earth from a, from a um, toxic lake in northern China and made a set of vases out of them. So in terms of finding the way to return that story or that narrative back into a stream of um, cultural narrative and kind of poke at something, uh, we made a set of vases which were um, in the silhouette of precious Ming vases. It's a kind of um, anti-luxury object um, to display in a museum. So the idea is to try and unpick some kind of absurdity um, to poke something with a stick, I guess. Yeah. So in, for example, like successful projects in, in, in our case, in last people running, they typically start by trying to find intersection between natural processes and, and, and social and human needs driven processes. And they try to answer questions which are not necessarily linked to the site. I think that Kate actually quite nicely put before this rejection of site as a bounded piece of ground, but, mm. but actually as a, as a more generalizable condition that can be depicted in many cases in atlases. So we don't really ask the questions, can you do a master plan in Plymouth, but what can you do about the eroding coastline of the UK, for instance, as a way of, of maybe framing a site for us or, or condition. I think in, in many ways, um, although some of the architecture and, and the constructs that we build are, are pretty out there, um, we start fundamentally from traditional timber technologies. So although we, we will attach something crazy like a chainsaw to a robot, um, it will start fundamentally looking at Japanese joinery. So, so the stuff we, we start from, from, from a basic point of departure and then 
as Kate said, we kind of pick apart methodologies and try and reinvent them and translate them to wood and, and with the help of our digital tools. For example, in your case, there's something, and I don't know to what extent you could say it's contextual or not. You, instead of just getting the wood and cutting it and making whatever wood technologies do, mm. you, you have some projects where you looked at the branches of the trees to actually figure out which ones had the right angle for the right mm -hmm. object that you would and you cut those branches. Would you say that the product itself is more specific or more site related to the type of wood that you found than an average sort of like mm. process where you just cut the wood and you turn it into abstract cubes or abstract mm -hmm. slabs? Would you say that that's a bit of a more contextual or not really? Because at the end of the day, you can always find that the branch with the right angle anywhere. Mm. Yeah. any forest but but it clearly starts because we are embodied within within you know it's our ecosystem that surrounds mm -hmm. us so we we go and explore our immediate surroundings yeah and i think we have that kind of weird luxury isn't it we have that kind of contained sort of microcosm of material source land site mm. you know we kind of inhabit that and it's kind of there's a sort of but now way of saying that like we inhabit our site and therefore mm -hmm. it's kind of very kind of direct but I think there's a kind of deeper, a deeper version of that where you really need, like time spent with the forest at Hook is always probably the most highly recommended thing for anyone visiting because there's an understanding there of, I mean, that the previous question, I guess, how you kind of, you know, what was your question, you know, the tools to reveal and track change, I guess, in landscape and like you know, the forest still lives that over a kind of life cycle that's very different to our kind of design project cycle and that really opens up a whole different kind of attitude, I think, to, what, what's out there, but and I think there's, I mean, on the you kind of reflected on the the grounded teenager thing, which was kind of a obviously just being slightly <laughs> kind of you know something about the very particular cons kind of just the you know the narrowed down constraint and the focus that that means about being in one you know in one place and kind of concentrating very hard. But I don't think that should be the at the expense. I feel like what Kate's suggesting, you know, that you have to be aware of kind of the, you know, the, the corresponding impact that what you are, you know, that what you are doing is, is having. I think another, I don't know, there's something I'm trying to kind of get, there's something in the contradiction of the title. Like, are we the kind of the grounded people who are kind of less sort of, but it shouldn't be that, you know, that we're actually, I don't know, there should be a more extreme version of kind of, of what we're doing. But I, I think in a way, that us being grounded in this place, and it, which comes with the characteristics, but allows us to be renegades, to kind of to kind of sets us free to hijack our tools and stuff, which are, you know, we don't operate according to the conventions, mm -hmm. right? It, it'd be really easy to, to build quite standard uh, timber constructs, but we try to reinvent um, the way we deal with, them, with, with a quite conventional material of timber. But I think that also applies also to the nature of fieldwork as well, this notion of having to adapt. I think adaptability is very important when discussing this notion of being grounded because for us, one thing that we found is despite the fact, for example, um, for all of our cataloging, we thought we would go through the formal channels to get licenses, et cetera. But we, what we found out is actually during our first year, unfortunately, um, five of our, for, for example, uh, five of our students were out in Mecca taking photographs. Um, five of them got arrested by the police. Um, because of the very fact that they, were, they had cameras in Mecca documenting a holy site. So what that prompted us to do is a reaction in terms of adapting is we, I wouldn't say necessarily invent, but you have to kind of like go around, let's say the norm and like kind of, yeah, I would say invent more creative ways to go about doing stuff. And that's something that for us has really become part of our, the nature of our work. Like you have to be as creative as possible when taking a photograph, for example. You have to be as creative as possible when you're taking a measurement in the mosque. You can't exactly just come out with a tape measure, no. Maybe go with a string or something like, stuff like that. So I think there's... I think it's also, I think for me, it was like fe not feeling grounded or feeling ungrounded um, in a way which was kind of like a prompt or a driver to kind of like pose a question um, or like kind of finding, you know, what does it mean to be grounded? Um, or what, do, what does that feel like? So I guess it can be something as, you know, as personal from, 
something that you eat or a film that you watch or so it's it's kind of just being kind of quite open to um knowing where that comes from and then just following it through i guess um because i i think for me it's like i kind of went from being in contemporary art to like not really being I don't have a design background, but now I'm like in a studio where I work with two industrial designers. And it just, for me, I feel a bit floaty still. Like I just feel ungrounded. So I think like I'm kind of trying to ground myself constantly um, via the studio and the practice, so. Yeah, I mean, I think I was, we were very careful when writing the description for this lecture to not use the word site specific because I think that doesn't quite capture what any of you are doing and actually although a place or an approach or strategies on how to approach something as massive as landscape or territory um, is the driver maybe for each of for what each of you do it's definitely not the limit of that I think it the research and the um, the practices you're all developing go far beyond that and um, and I think the Ava and I spent a very long time brainstorming what to call each of these positions <laughs> Um, and in the end, we went with actually positions that relate to the, like that would relate to a kind of intellectual position, but also a physical position of your body. And I, um, I think this is the first session where each of you have actually stated your take on the actual word um, grounded and also what that means in terms of a concept you're struggling with or um, interrogating. So it's, I, for that, it's been really interesting to like kind of really unpack that through all these perspectives. And um, I think, I guess time is running out, so, but I, to conclude, I kind of noticed as, as you were going around that all of you, most of you are involved in teaching as a, as a kind of form of practice, as a way to kind of broaden this beyond an individual working with a territory. Um, and actually students are contributing to this and um, our, our collaborators. And then Spandana, in your case, you're having conversations with all these different people, like when you were just showing the modern Kanta project, working with, um, like traditional craft in India versus industrial craft that they're, that actually the traditional craftsman was suggesting you use. Yeah. I thought it was a really fascinating back and forth. Yeah. So I think there's a bigger conversation that each of you are having that's quite fascinating. And I just wondered whether everyone could just speak a bit to that, like what role teaching plays in, in kind of working on this like larger project um, or this kind of what role conversation plays. Yeah, I think it's just, um, again, it's kind of being open, but because even even though I'm Indian and I kind of, you know, go into a factory, I still feel intimidated because I feel that, um, I, I guess you're kind of constantly projecting, you're projecting on a site, you're projecting a, on a person, you're kind of projecting on the scenario. And the, the fact that you kind of need to do a lot of unlearning along the way, uh, I think that's really crucial. Um, so I think for me, I've kind of had to unlearn a lot of what I know and kind of start from the beginning. So being open to that and having a lot of vulnerabilities, I think, um, but also just being okay to make mistakes, like make tons of mistakes and it's okay. It's fine. Um, yeah. I mean, I think our approach to teaching, like to doing this work while teaching, um, number one is because we wanted to learn as well. And um, we very much engage in the back and forth with, I mean, when I say students, it's really more a collaborative. And also, um, and, and this, I mean, it is the reality, unfortunately, like if this was not an academic project, this was not, our work would not be possible, quite simply in Saudi. The only reason that it's being, I would say accepted, we still face a lot of problems, is because it's being presented, as, let's say, as an academic teaching exercise. So for us, the pragmatics of it is something we cannot. But again, it is very useful not to say that we undermine the, the benefit of working with students or educators as well. Um, maybe uh, for us, I mean, the issue of uh, well, teaching is uh, almost like a platform to, to speculate other ways in which the profession can operate no? or can be grounded, no? like to coming back to this idea. Uh, in the sense that um, what I think the program is trying to produce is like a what if question. Uh, if we are involved in other levels uh, of the production of a space that uh, normally architects wouldn't be 
in both. No? For example, um, at the scale that we work, many of the projects can be seen more like policies. No? Um, policies are uh, this uh, set of rules or regulations that somehow produce a space without being actually designed. No? And many of the projects that uh, uh, students produce are about that. No? What are um, what if design could actually be part of the conversations that uh, policy makings are having? No? Uh, and because we realize that many large parts of space, no, like in landscapes and territory, especially productive landscapes, are being produced by regulations that are written no, without having certain consequences or knowing the spatial consequences that these regulations will have. And, and for us uh, in the program, we use that as a speculation to see, well, uh, if these people are actually writing, writing these regulations that have a, a, an enormous impact, no? I mean, it's, um, you've seen, I mean, in Kate's work and also in our work, how many landscapes are being produced just because, you know, the requirement of certain um, energies, uh, uh, material uh, that are required for building are necessary to do that. No? So that's something that we use and say, well, perhaps the role of the architect uh, can actually be not only in the in the let's say final product no? somehow, no? which I think is very relevant. But at the same time, we see design can be involved in other uh, discussions, and that's how the school uh, allows us to to kind of get involved. And a couple of thoughts. Sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, teaching is communication, isn't it? And it's. Uh, it's a two-way thing, obviously. It's um, you know, we should be asking the students really the question, but um, and I suppose you know most of our communication is verbal, you know, and words only have meaning with reference, with you know, with a referent. And you know, I think the term that is used in linguistics is that the, you know the word needs to be grounded. Like I think that is the word, isn't it? That technologists use whatever. Like it is, you know, it is a you know, for for the word, I mean, every word that we've described only means stuff because there's a kind of context and an understanding that we've gained through learning from each other what that means. So there's something kind of fundamental, I think, isn't there, about how we communicate that requires that grounding. Um, I guess the other thought that's kind of crossed my mind was like when I was on the train up and I was kind of looking for a, a good quote about grounded, being grounded, and every quote I found was like B-list celebrities basically saying, um, you know, my family, my kids keep me so grounded, and you know, so I should put on a sort of American pop star accent, but I won't. Um, but you know, it was it was always that. It was almost like the groundedness allowed their extreme kind of lifestyle to be okay because there was a sort of sensible side to things. And I know maybe there's some kind of parallel with the kind of the tutors kind of holding things together, but allowing the students to pursue extremes. If you know what I mean, something some, yeah. some analogy there. I, I think. When we write the briefs, it's very much a provocation. You know, we kind of set the ground rules, but we hope everyone can develop and, and work as a team to kind of expand from there. It's not a containment. It is just a frame of reference to, to expand from. I think for us, um, it's quite simple. We teach because it's fun. And I think what fun also means is you have a space to be humorous, to enjoy, to play, and that's not always so easy to come by. Um, and I think teaching for both, it, it's a place for both students and uh, tutors to have that space in which nothing is too ridiculous or unspeakable. And it's through that sort of um, relationship that makes it enjoyable for us and hopefully also productive for everyone. Great, well, um, that's an inspirational note to end on. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you for participating and thank you everyone for coming. Um, the last lecture in the series this term um, is on the 19th of November, so please join us for that. It's the word that time is engaged and it's talking about audience, how do we engage audiences in the creation of space. Um, but for now, I invite you all to have a drink in the South Jury Room and um, maybe since none of you asked a question, um, you can ask them some questions more informally over drinks. Thank you. Thank you.